Welcome to television. Thank you. So as pictures from the early age uh, of television efforts show us as amateurs having fun in a world surrounded by professional television production, the biggest technical challenge for any amateur operator has always been how to produce the highest picture quality on a budget. It seems that your microphone might not be turned on. Yeah. Not this morning either. Hello. I see the, I'm like maxing out the microphone here, but so I don't know why it's not showing up here. Yeah, so please send your comments to Marriott <laughs> San Ramon. Yeah, I, um, I can't fix everything. <laughs> and then you can't get in. So I will just ye uh, attempt to yell as loud as I can because I don't want that door to shut. The last guy I lost a bunch of people that tried to get into his talk and they won't unlock the door. So I'm sorry if you're at the back of the door, there's emptier seats up here. So if you can't hear from the, the din out there, just move up here. All right, so the pictures from early amateur television efforts show us as amateurs having fun. And so it was all black and white. These pictures from early amateur television efforts show us, why do I have this thing duplicated five times? Interesting. So um, we're having too much fun. This, these pictures go back from the, the manuals from like back in 1963. I captured some of this from the, the earlier handbooks that are still posted on the AWR website. Uh, that are listed as printed as 1993. So what does that tell you guys? 20 years later and not much has changed. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the handbook, uh, most of what's in the current 2016 issue, I have not seen the 2017 yet, is like they've collapsed it down to a page. It's kind of like, wow. And oh, by the way, uh, so one of the tests for being able to uh, you know, qualify how good your picture was, this guy had to gain altitude. So how do how many people have a gyrocopter that you can just jump in and go, you know, fly around? Why aren't my notes changing with the page here? So this is awkward because all my notes are my talking points and I can't see my notes. Wow. Wow. Okay. So if I resume the slideshow, it doesn't move the notes. Thank you, Windows. OK, <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um, so basically, did you get the picture? Um, a lot of people have been doing amateur television for quite some time, but it's a very small niche group. You know who I'm talking about. There are only so many people on the planet that are doing television. But, but basically, it's because of this problem on the left. It's getting enough system gain, and that's what I'm here to talk about mostly. So what will you broadcast? So basically, uh, they started from uh, televising uh, from their car to doing events for educational purposes. So they did a, a, a setup where a teacher in one town televised into another schoolroom far away. Here's some guy that's the president of his club, and he's showing off their amateur television repeater in Baton Rouge, and my God, he's wearing a tie. Somebody get some scissors quick. <laughs> so here's a typical cue. So you know, you get on the air, what are you going to talk about? So basically, this comes down to what do you want to prepare? So from all the subjects we can broadcast, wh when you decide to flip the switch, what are you going to talk about? So where are you going to point the camera? See, this is annoying. I can't deal with the not changing my notes. I got to have my notes because I don't know what to say otherwise. You thought I was going to ration. Yeah, I get that. So preparation is everything. So basically, here's what you see now. This is a, a, a typical video editor kind of guy. Uh, he's you know sitting at a video editor, and so this is where somebody's just run out and shot everything, and then he's producing and assembling a program. So basically, this is nothing like doing anything live, but this is what's happening. This is more about what's going on with, if you watch things on YouTube, uh, that's how people basically get started. Uh, AGE was just in here. He uses a Sony Editor, and he puts on some great programs on YouTube. And, Bob Heil at, does Ham Nation. So basically, there's somebody that's doing this in the background. 
Does that work? No, of course not. Man, why is this so complicated? Hmm. Yeah, resume. Why does this do that? Wow, this is annoying. So, but in either case, the operator will need to put some effort into producing a quality picture, and the rest becomes a question of content, talent, and production value. If you step back and look at all the problems to overcome in pursuit of producing a high-quality program or to improve system game, we always look for new technology or a new way to deploy old technology in hopes to greatly improve the system game. I got to come up with a better way to do this. <laughs> so I got to do this every time. The trick is to find the right technology which is both easy and economical to obtain. <sighs> okay, so the trick is mm -hmm, I just said that. Thank you. Some challenges may require a major leap of faith, and I just took one today by trying to do this presentation from Microsoft slideshow here. So anyway, we'll try to make some sense out of this here. Okay, so we are the original hackers. I don't know if everybody understands what happens at uh, Maker Fairs and DEF CON and all that kind of stuff. They're just discovering ham radio. We've been doing it for how long, guys, boys and girls? A long time. Just visit the QCWA booth over here. Who's a member? Quarter Century Wireless. Come on, raise your hands. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. We've been doing it for so long. Why didn't people figure this out? So anyway, I think it was the Morse code that kind of freaked everybody out. All right. Why won't this advance? Yeah. Are we not curious? Watch what happens when I do this. Okay, so we lost a lot uh, over the years. Um, you see it up in the corner. Heathkid had a color television, but they they were going after you know you the craft builder trying to get into the you know the consumer products kind of you build the consumer product. Well, they fell short of being able to uh, uh, move that momentum into a highly modular world. So their kits were through hole and large resistors and all that kind of stuff. And they never made the transition. No, they got caught up in, in computers and stuff. So you know the rest of that story. G1? <laughs> yeah, that thing. Come on, why doesn't... Mm. Well, I apologize. This is obviously not my finest presentation. Come on, resume. Okay, so why are we here? So if you don't try, and a lot of us are trying, then you find out. But if you don't, just like him, hey. So was he playing Powerball, by the way? You never know. You can't win if you don't play. Right. Okay, some history. So this is what happened. Um, like in one day, we lost uh, a bunch of transmitters. Uh, basically, it's not lost. The, the industry transitioned from analog to digital. And so back in June 2009, uh, we, along with a bunch of other countries, we started to turn the, the transmitters off. And we are still continuing. It's still moving through other countries. It takes some countries longer. Uh, Brazil is probably going to be one of the last ones because it's a very complicated system and their society is pretty... Um, complicated. So anyway, uh, but as we went through time, basically everything that anybody ever knew about broadcast was based on one channel was, you know, six megahertz was one channel. That's it. If you change the channel to another channel, it's another six megahertz. It's another channel. So forth and so on. So basically, <laughs> when, we, when we did the transition, we lost some people. And that's what they were afraid of. So they were worried about what happens when you turn the transmitter. Well, do we have that problem? No, we have the other problem. We're just trying to get people to turn the, you know, the transmitters on. And so we just have a lack of transmitters. So, but this is what we're competing against, too. At the same time, uh, 
Others are, are posting videos up to YouTube and are they going to give us uh, uh, copy left uh, rights to be able to send those out? Because we're not trying to make any money, we're trying to get the word out. But so yeah, there's some uh, talk going on about being able to take YouTube produced videos and transmit them on ATV, but that's a really complicated and it's a tough topic. So anyway, our early pioneers of television basically paved the road for everything we have to be able to be thanked for because we don't really necessarily have to invent anything. Our problem is just get the things soldered up and on the air. And so now, uh, looking forward, we got the next thing coming along. So, but digital was this big change. And along with that change came some problems and basically uh, this kind of thing happened. And so fortunately we had some uh, backup support, but basically uh, the same kind of thing is going to start to happen in analog television when we transition to digital, you're still going to have some people that don't get the signal. But so the early beginnings uh, have already started right here in our own backyard, thank God. Um, thanks to the team and uh, our sponsors here at the show, uh, we're on the air with uh, a digital uh, multiplex off of Mount Diablo. But Batsy is really the one to be applauded. They've really been paving the road. They're the ones that are actually pioneering out there. <laughs> but so, um, yeah, there was some infight, insightful words to say here, but my notes haven't What's done. Uh, British Amateur Television Club. So it started back when it was still analog, but now if you go to their website today, you'll see lots of clips that are posted up on YouTube about how they're moving digital fast, rapidly. They're narrow banding and stuff. But so basically, um, without my notes, this slide is meaningless. <laughs> okay, here we go. So to be clear, the concept of building and operating an analog television system has always meant one channel equals one video. With digital, this is simply not true anymore. But digital has a learning curve and some gotchas. The, conver the conversion from analog to digital will introduce a range of, of new challenges and the basis of this paper. Furthermore, oh yeah, by the way, this is my paper. I'm going to post this up on my website later because I had to get it done for today. But so basically, there's a whole bunch of words I'm not reading to you because of this calamity kind of thing, so I'll just encourage you at the end to download the paper and then you can read what I was supposed to tell you today. All right, so moving on. Oh yes, resume slideshow again because it doesn't know that I want to... Oh, come on, why doesn't it do what I say? Oh, this is annoying. Okay, increasing system gain. <laughs> so we know what the we know what the problem is, right? Uh, we need more power, Mr. Scott. So basically, we've been trying to come up with ways to be able to clean up the picture. Based on the analog system, what do we know what happens when we start pushing too much power? You start to get into problems. So we have this issue of not enough power and the picture is snowy. Too much power and you distort it to the point where now all of a sudden people can't get a lock and so then you have the other problem. So we're always striving to get into the Goldilocks zone. So to overcome path losses, it's better just to be able to get people to start building little LNAs if they can't get a lock or the picture drops out. But then too comes the problem of if the, if the LNA part or device that you chose injects just enough noise that the receiver is perturbed by that, then you get the other problem. So it's a balancing act. You're trying to find this, this narrow band of, of happiness. Oh, boy. Yeah. So to overcome, I don't know, I just said that. Come on. Work with me. So you can't please all the people all the time. That's going to be the issue. There's always going to be one guy on the, the fringe or one person that's more particularly challenged trying to get his setup to work. So that's the guy we, we need to like find out what the issues are to try and help the guy. <sighs> you got to see what I'm dealing with here. Okay, now we go to the next one. Whew. So to work around issues in AM television, some amateurs opted to use FM video. Any signal which is modulated produces sidebands and FM is no exception. So we know what happened. When you went to FM, it was 18 megahertz wide. 
Well, so that kicked you out of being able to be channelized where the, um, the coordinations were six megahertz wide. So you had no choice but to move other places, which then put you kind of in a, in a un unique solution area where you had to have very specific receivers for those frequencies. So in other words, it created another problem. So in other words, FM is a great choice. Why? Power density. Why did the VCR guys use FM? Why did the satellite use that? If you had good capture lock, the picture looked great. It was a great thing because you could drive the snot out of the amplifiers. Everybody understands the difference between AM and FM. The AM would get compressed, and then you gives rise to the problem of the issues of the signals being distorted. FM, you could push into it, but then it's this wide monster you're dealing with kind of thing. The satellite guys didn't have the problem in the early days. But so later over time, uh, they discovered they wanted to move on. So this is a, a snapshot from Galaxy 11, and you can see what's going on. Each one of those is a QPSK modulator. Uh, each is a transponder, I should say. Um, the one I'm pointing to is actually where you can pull down NASA TV. If you know the symbol, right? It's free to air. It's right there. And so what they did was they evolved their industry to be able to maximize on being able to get up and through the satellite. So FM was not very bandwidth efficient. Digital was. So then with the advent of digital, they were able to put more channels. So inside the you know, 16, 18 megahertz of an FM carrier, they can put in lots of little channels or one big fat one or ultra HD, stuff like that. So higher profiles. Thank you. You got through the locked door. I appreciate you making my talk. We're struggling with Microsoft. OK, so anyway. Awesome. So the workaround uh, that you're looking here is, so the waveform is this issue. So when you start running symbol rates, what you'll notice is when you increase the symbol rate, it gets wider. So you can tailor it, and that is a very unique advantage because you can't do that in analog. When you turn your analog, it's always 6 megahertz. But when it's digital, it can be as little as or as much as. It's, it's, it's a knob that you can turn. So basically, this is the, one of the main takeaways for going digital. And this is what one of the things we're looking at for being able to be responsible about our spectrum usage so we can all get along kind of thing. So we have a choice. So uh, to get started, you know, you have to start looking at what are you going to do to build your station. So there's a problem of parts. And so there's all these modules that you can go find, and they're all over the place. And there's products from here, there, and everywhere on eBay. But the problem is, how do you get everything working with all your friends and your hams so that the systems will work? And so what I would point out is there's a huge industry out there spending millions of dollars trying to gain business from people that are actually trying to do this stuff professionally. And here we are trying to do the same thing. So there's people that are, they'll sell you a little eval chipboard and they hope that you buy them by the millions, okay? Because that's the kind of business they want. The problem is the guys that are walking up and down those halls, they're looking for something like this. This is an HD H264 encoder that's currently on the air. Well, not in the one in my hand, but the one that looks like it. This one's kind of out of service, so I can touch it. But this is the kind of horsepower that those guys are looking for, and this is what we were looking for. The problem is this guy won't sell to you unless you want to buy a bazillion of the things, and this guy wants a couple thousand, well, <clears throat> a little more than that. But anyway, he wants a lot of money, okay? But this is the kind of compression efficiency engine we're trying to get to. So what's the problem here? You can't afford that. Well, maybe. You know what's happening? It's real simple. All my gear is starting to, sh you, do you know who I am? Do you know what DirecTV is? Yes. You're watching the equipment I put on the air. Do you know what KGO is? Mm -hmm. KNTV, KPIX, KTSF, Univision, Telemundo, 80% of the stations in this market have been using my gear and still do to this day. And so what's happened is over the last seven years, they've depreciated off the dollars, the cost of these units, 
And they've moved on to my next ones because of that kind of efficiency. So the point is, these things are, this MV50, oh, that's an MV100. That was our first a, uh, SD AVC encoder. It cost me close to $20,000 in the day to make my cost, my cost. I'd sell that encoder for close to $60,000, $99.99. Holy smokes, I can't make it for that price. But so this is what I'm talking about. All these things are starting to show up. And I'm, it's not just my product. There's Tanberg's, there's Ericsson's, there's Harris's, there's, there's a lot of other products out there. So the point is, is it, switch, is it hard to switch to, to digital? Uh, uh, no. Okay, so I'm saying it from the perspective of, I know what, what's involved. So I'm here to tell you it's not that hard. So basically, yeah, can you count the number of repeaters? This is up on San Bruno. So this is basically where we live. And so the, the point is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to just share with the ham community because I know the ham community is a little bit challenged. And so there's a lot of stuff that's going on and there's problems with boards and people trying to sell stuff from Taiwan. I'm just saying for one of the price of one of these and a modulator, and the trick is to find the modulator, that'll sync up with these little boxes. All you're trying to do is to feed these things because this is what's more commutable because it's a very ham-friendly device. So you can't afford this thing. And yes, because it's very complicated, it's, it's hard to keep up. What you have to appreciate is the price of this was like 35 bucks. So to build a receive station is simple. So where to begin? So you should probably start with NTSC. In a little system we mocked up down the hallway here, I'll show you what I did. It's actually very simple. It's one of those uh, hotel modulators that you see them on eBay for $39.95 or whatever. And basically they're throwing away their analog stuff now because they're converting the hotels to digital and so forth. So in other words, go look for one of these things and you can start on analog for dirt cheap or PC Electronics is the other guy and so forth. Um, which what you're going to shoot for is channel 58. So all the consumer TVs that have the tuner that's built in, you get that for free. You put it in cable mode, snap channel 58 into the, the guide, the, the, the channel thing, and all of a sudden you'll be able to pick up one of these modulators tuned to the same frequency. So analog TV starts with the camera, hook it to the modulator, hit a little power amplifier, Magic occurs, and then you hit your TV, boom. There's your closed circuit or the beginning of your ATV system. <laughs> but now you want to get the signal out. So then we talked about the problem of when you start to run more power in analog, you get, this, you get the compression distortion on the pulses problem. Okay, so that's, that's why um, getting started with this, you're going to learn some of the things that the guys have known for many years that have been doing this for since 60s and on. So basically converting to digital amateur television means you're going to replace the modulator with a digital modulator, that kind of yellow one in the middle, but you're going to add an encoder and then the power amplifier can be the same one for the same band, but now you don't have to be as uh, careful because QPSK is like an FM you can push it up into saturation because it's QPSK, it has no AM component. And so that's why truck encoders um, have some of these uh, parts and pieces all integrated into a single box. And um, uh, you'll notice uh, Mount Diablo just uh, picked up a, a van from KGO because Al used to work, Al over here at the satellite booth uh, used to work there, Al Boker. And uh, he knows everybody. I know, I've known Al for many, many years. And every time I go up to KGO to visit, you know, we just sit down and talk ham. And then, oh, yeah, I'm here for work, darn. You know, kind of thing. well, so he's hooking up guys with the vans. But so analog is still good. It's still a great format. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, some of the inputs to Mount Diablo are analog. Some are digital, some are analog. So. They, they're working on a mixing switching system, so if you come in on one, it switches to the other, and so basically, there's nothing wrong with analog. The pro, and well, so you know what the problem is. Uh, there's, there's way more to do in digital. Okay, so 
I got to launch my first Ultra HD TV station this year. And so I've already kind of been blessed with the ability to see what HEVC can do. But the problem for us hams is, and there's people that are talking about it, well, why don't you use HEVC? Well, there's a lot to it. But so basically, we need to examine a little more about what that system means before we go there. Uh, there's people that are very knowledgeable, and they know a lot. And so you're trying to read between the lines, and it's not very obvious what's going on. But basically, I wanted to point out this is... Uh, Chief Engineer, and so we basically this is all, this is the uh, ERI antenna guy. Uh, these are the guys that work at the station. That's Joseph C at Gates Air. Here I am, and here's the guys from Trevini. And basically, we lit off, and everybody was happy, so we took a picture. But um, I'll have to tell them I plugged them anyway. So let's examine the systems. So what we're going to do is start looking at what you want to put up on digital. So 1.2 gig band is the natural because guess what? The port that they build into these are meant to be able to hook up to a satellite dish which has an L-band interface. Well, the L-band is smack in the middle. It's 950 to 220. So the IRD tunes the entire 1.2 gig band. Boom. So that was a natural move. So it also puts out 18 volts. So the question is, what are you going to do with it? If you so don't feed the 18 volts up to an M squared. It doesn't like it. So the, the thing is you have to put a little uh, bypass capacitor so you don't drive power into their little uh, uh, coupler. But so you can either turn the DC off in the IRD. Some of the IRDs have a menu so you can shut it off or add a DC block, as I mentioned, or tap into the DC and use it to run a little LNA. That's a cool feature. So basically, we're also going to extend it even further and start talking about, and this is my next paper, about the converters that we're going to start building as the kits to be able to front in this so you can get it on other bands like 3 gig, 5 gig, 10 gig. So that's come next year and you'll see that paper. So basically it's all about feeding these things. So there's also the commercial version of these that um, don't have as many cool little slick menus, but they give you more knobs. This one, it's got its software, so you have to deal with their software, but it's basically a consumer device, so it's meant for people that, well, where do you click the button? You know what I'm saying. So it's, it's actually, you have to just learn how to use their software, and you're good to go. What's an IRD? Integrated Receiver Decoder. So it has a receiver front end and a decoder. So it, it has both of them in the box at the same time. So when I showed you on the chart up there, when you're making a DATV system, the encoder and the modulator are typically not integrated, except in the case of a truck encoder. But so if they were in the same, then it would be an integrated encoder modulator. But so it's a, an IRD is a very common thing. It's the, both the receiver and the, the smarts to be able to decode the pictures. So this is the paradigm shift. Is it a duck or a rabbit? And so where do you want to spend your money is the question. Uh, do you want to focus on being able to improve the signal on analog? Well, it depends on the user base in your area. Or do you want to get on to digital? i got to speed up because I'm running out of time. So the biggest problem with digital is there is a delay. Guess what? There's a buffer. Get used to it. There's no way to get around it unless you start doing some very clever things. So to make a low delay encoder, you have to do some very unique things, so much so some of these decoders won't know what to do with the special stuff. So then you have to get the really expensive decoder. That's the problem. It's a, it's a balancing act. So I think it's just better to get used to the fact that there's a delay. Everybody else that's just watching that's not participating in the QSO, they won't know. It's only the guy that's you know doing some kind of an exchange, yeah, they'll notice. And we've all seen it before. The guy in the field's doing the report. and. Over to Joe over in the field, and he's standing there, and it's called the MPEG pause. And that's because there's this latency kind of thing. So anyway, let's talk about setup. I've been uh, looking at these things because everybody that's flying drones, they're buying these cameras like crazy. And they're actually great little cameras. But they, they're meant to be you know, beat up and flown through trees or whatever, but so they... They don't deal with light levels sometimes very well, and they're kind of fisheye, so you all look a little goofy or fat, you know, and that kind of stuff. So there's other camera choices you can look at. But basically, 
can we have fun together? It's the, when you start putting the systems together, it's the, we don't really care which camera you pick. I don't care. It's just a, a matter of being able to get people on the air. There was more to that slide. Anyway, video editing is one of the next things you're going to want to start doing. So that way, when it's time for you to key down, maybe all you do is hit the play button on a file you've already made and you just play it out from your computer. That's another thing. You don't have to rely on the camera systems. Uh, one of the things I ran into, and this is just personal experience, I ran into an RFI problem. So I figured out a way to solve the problem because of that's an optical interface and the little cable that you use to interface it is non-conductive. I decoupled the problem, problem went away. Um, so I also ran into all these little things. There's a po power plug for everything and I started to run out of power plugs in my, la in my um, laboratory. So anyway, uh, you know, you have to start looking at that. And then I had to start wondering, how much power is all this stuff consuming when I turn it on? Fortunately, a lot of this stuff runs on, this is like six watts. So this is very economical. But so then I started, you know, when I, I'm, I'm building up the, the light in my, my little shack area, and these lights are really expensive, but they're professional, high-end, and I'm trying to minimize noise sources, so I didn't want to use any fluorescence and things like that, but incandescent bulbs are really power hungry, so I went online and bought a thousand of these LEDs from China for like 1.2 cents each, so then I just started making my own little light panel. And then I found these little cameras. These are the ones that they use at banks. Now the reason why, it's actually an Ikigami, but it's marketed by a company called Hamilton. But the reason why banks use those, clarity. They make really good pictures so they can see your face through the mask and everything. So it's a, it's a very great camera for being able to uh, get good definition uh, through composite video. They're actually very uh, great little cameras. So then there's all the talk I have to do about modulation systems. So basically, in a nutshell, uh, all these systems, which were standardized, were based on the, you know, what, was, what are we trying to do in the industry? So basically, you got to get on with the process of getting on, you know, your channel on the air. So they're based on the current FCC or the PTTs that, you know, they give you a license to be on the air. Well, so they're all, you know, designed to fit in a carrier. Yes, you can modify the modulator and make it change the bandwidth, but now you've just done what? You just did a proprietary. And so there are people that are making those devices out there. But one of them was somebody asked me, why wouldn't you use 8VSB? Because it's built into my TV. And I just tell them, look, I do this for a job. I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. A, it's stuck on 6 megahertz, so it's always 1939 megabits per second. Then you got to deal with PSIP, and it's like, I deal with, that's my job. I, I don't want to take that one home. So basically, I was like, no, we ain't going to do that. So basically, we want to stay open source. Uh, and anybody will tell you it's much easier to get the information you need. And if you don't like what you see, you can modify it. So basically, when it's out in the open, we can touch it, modify it, and use it to our purpose. When it's closed and proprietary, then you got to deal with the licensing and stuff like that. So. DVBS has been published for a very long time. You can see right there, um, version 1.1.2 hasn't been touched since 1997. This is right off the standards website. So basically, we point to that as, look, that's an easy document. It's pretty lightweight, easy to read. So then why not QAM? So I wanted to point this one out specifically because of uh, QAM is also in your TV. But the thing is, again, it's stuck at six megahertz because it's designed to work for cable TV. And yes, it's a great payload. It's got anywhere from 27 up to 38 megabits per second. That's a lot of data. You can put many, 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 many videos in that size of a pipe, but here's the rub. So as you can see on the chart, and I modified the chart, the source is W6RG down in California. So back in 2014, he mapped out where the performance is. And so what you'll see is, Qualm is way up at the top end, so to get a nice lock, you have to have lots of power in a low noise environment. So it is like the worst choice you can pick for trying to do weak signal work. So then you look down the list and you can see how AM and FM track up through, you know, when you start increasing the power and the power goes up, you can see 
how they degrade or improve as the case may be as you go up and down in power. But notice the chart also includes ATSC, DVBT at two mega symbol, which I thought was an interesting choice, but he forgot one. So if you go do the research, you'll find out the DVBS by itself, QPSK, operates even lower than, excuse me, Coftum, because it has even less processing requirements. So it does a better job. And I, I'm really curious, and I'm going to have to fire them off an email and say, so why did you forget that one? That's kind of important. That's where I want to be, where I'm working way down in the noise level as, as much as I can. So the winner clearly was QPSK. It's all about you know putting all your wood behind one arrow. And this clearly demonstrates it. As you can see in these constellation charts, the one on the right, that's a QAM 16. So what we're dealing with here is the fact that those symbols are both in space and the, the location. So basically, I have to deal with amplitude and vector to create a QAM. And so the amplitude is the one that kills you. If you get too many variations in amplitude, you get too many errors, boom, there's the problem. QPSK doesn't have that problem. So as you can see, it's just got the, the two bits per symbol, and basically, as long as it gets across that little threshold boundary, you can get a lock. So it just needs enough power. So the modulator, ah, eh, we don't need to cover that. If you want more information, this was um, uh, one of the things I did a little bit of research on. But so this is what the guys are building in FPGAs. So this is what they're, they're essentially boiling up into their uh, designs. All right, so did I skip something? No, I didn't. So anyway, video compression. So basically, there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, this is going to be about another hour and a half. Uh, please stay with me, and we'll start handing coffee out here pretty soon. Now, basically, that's a whole topic unto itself. Um, it's, it's very complicated, but even back then, Batman was saying MPEG-2. So basically, um, there's a lot of codecs to choose from. And right now, we currently have these three, MPEG-2 being the oldest. It's got the widest amount of support, but it takes the most amount of bandwidth compared to the other two. Well, because over time, we started to do the work and research it took to be able to reduce the compression, the thing is, um, uh, those devices are fewer and far between. So there's way many more MPEG-2 products out there because HEVC, it's too new. We're struggling to get parts that we need for our products just to be able to get into the market. And so, you know, they'll get there, just give it time. But right now, we're just now starting to see AVC products fall out of um, uh, rotation. So the question is, which one is it? So there's tools out there that will tell you which one you're looking at. And basically, here, uh, you know, our friends are trying to figure that out. So basically, here's what they're trying to figure out. Processing power. You need a lot of horsepower to decode HEVC. Um, I can't tell you how many coolers we had to put on the Intel chips to be able to keep the computer from melting at the trade show. It was, it was a lot of work to keep, because they're running at such high clock rates, and we're pumping a lot of data through the buses. Those things were really hot. So basically, HEVC is a pig. But so MPEG-2, there you go. Single chip, right there. So that's been done because, thank you, Moore's Law. Moore's Law caught up and got us to where we are today. And then eventually, over time, we'll, we'll get to these others. Now, there's software tools. I don't take anything away from the presentation. I'm not selling anything here. The point is, you can go knock yourself out. This is stuff I do on a daily basis when I'm at work. People say, hey, can you look at this clip? So I open up my VLC, then I can see the video. And then I have this really big display, and the computer goes, Voo, and the fan takes off. And so basically, yes, I can decode video on my laptop. I do it all the time. But now do you want to lug your laptop everywhere? You, you know, so let's say you want to televise uh, uh, an ATV queue so from some remote location. You're going to drag all your computer equipment? Uh, that's maybe. So yeah, there's, there's all these things to go gla you know, glomming onto. So this is the stuff you want to start looking for because at, at some point, all that stuff is going to go away, and it's all going to be replaced by blade servers. We're moving into software. So all the ASIC designs are going away. And then there's audio compression. Okay, 
enough said, right? There's all these choices you can pick from, but MPEG-1 layer 2 was standardized so long ago, all the patents have expired. It's free. So let's say somebody, well, I want to do it in AC3. Well, not all the, this one can support it, but you have to pay more for it. So it almost doubles the cost of this little $35 IRD to license the Dolby AC3 license. So it's like, yeah, you don't need to go there. It, this one works good enough. And then we have to do a little bit of MPEG tables. So basically, this is what's coming out of the encoders. It's this stream of packets. You got videos, audios, a little bit of tables, and some null packets for stuffing. So at the end of the day, this is what you're trying to modulate. You're trying to get these packets over the air. But for a decoder to see these things, you have to send these things called tables. And the tables are what we're going to talk about next. So MPEG defined uh, patent PMT tables so that you can tune programs. Here, I'm showing the PAT table has two programs, program one, program two. So these are the pointers that in software finds the channels. This is some of the mechanisms behind it. This is what it looks like under the hood. But so this is what the standards committees do. They, they draft all this stuff. But so Norm is going to tell you, look, MPEG and DVB tables, that combination of tables is good enough. And so when it comes time to do digital, there's usually some settings in the equipment that turn on those tables. So then you st we still have a, you know, we're amateurs, we have a license. You still have to do the FCC rule thing. So you still have to put in the image Either you burn it in with software or you just hang some artwork in the background just so that you get your call sign on the air or you send CW. I have to mention that because people keep asking me, isn't tables good enough? Because you can say in the tables what your call sign is and it's technically not good enough yet. Maybe they'll change someday. So I got to speed up. <laughs> so everybody knows what that was. So this is what killed us. Uh, basically, we have no choice. But the cool thing is, if we're at home and we're running analog or digital on 440 up to the mountain, I don't think we're going to have any issues because you're not on the mountain, you're pointing to the mountain. So I think we're safe there. But so because of pave pause, it's forced us to start smacking all the other services we had into smaller spaces. So digital came along with you know, something that can help us. So the available resources that we needed meant we can start doing things like multiplexing. So I'm going to speed up here because I'm running out of time. So this is what a lot of the television broadcasters do every day. They have two encoders hooked together in a multiplexer to feed a modulator. That's how you see two channels at the same time. All the, the packets are time division multiplexed. QPSK calculation. So I wanted to touch on this just so that you get a little bit of math so you walk away with, did I try to teach you something for your calculator? Yes. Basically, you need to understand what the size of an MPEG packet is. It's 188 bytes. Reed Solomon adds another 16 bytes. QPSK is defined as two bits per symbol. So when you plug it into that formula, say for example, four megabits per second, you'll see you're going to use 2.89 mega symbols per second. So everybody follow along. So the Reed Solomon is added to an MPEG-2 TS packet. That's why it's 204. So because I need to know the bits per second being passed at the sum total of the size of the packet, that's why it's 204. Then you divide that by the number of bits in per symbol uh, times the number of uh, bits in a uh, in an MPEG-2 packet. So anyway, you see the math. So forward error correction. This is one of those things where inside the modulation, depending on how what the ratio is I use for forward error correction, I can pepper an extra packet or bits, in this case, to be able to fix certain errors. So the one we have in, in uh, QPSK is just row. So here I'm showing uh, one, two, three. So this is four, five. So there's four bits of active data and a fifth for error correction. So in my FEC setting, I'd set it to four, five. That's the mode I'd be in. So then you can see I can fix one symbol from that forward error correction. If I had much more complex, let's say I had column, then I could actually fix burst errors. And then if I had row and column, then you can get you know crazy, but then you can fix lots of errors 
and that's how we fix stuff on the internet. Then there's this other little thing. Okay, so we're modulating symbols, and that means we're going to create inter-symbol interference. So that's why we use a Nyquist roll-off filter. So basically, we don't want it to spread out. And what happens is, if you if you raise the gain on the amplifier of a QPSK, you'll see a, a little noise, a little bunch of dirt show up at the edge of the skirts. So you back off the amplifier because now you're just raising too much cosine energy. So basically, the roll-off is the question we needed to know to be able to apply to that symbol rate. So you take the, the symbol rate answer, multiply it by the roll-off, 1.25 for a 25% uh, roll-off, and now you know the actual occupied bandwidth. So simple, you take 289, multiply by 1.25, that's the actual occupied. So now you know the smarts behind how do you know how to pack your signals into the spectrum. So now if you want to work the problem in reverse, so let's remember, if I'm using 3.61 of a six meg channel, now you want to know what do you got to set your settings to to use what's left of the six? Then you work the problem in reverse. And then you just need to know how much error correction you can use given the symbol rate you're left with. And this is the, the cool thing is, so for the single operator, if he wants to have a really robust channel, he can only run 1.75 megabits. So you see what I just did. One to get on the air and one to fit in between the other guy. So if he's running at one rate, then you can only run with this before you go into the next set of frequencies. Yes, quick question. Does it, yeah, does it make him incompatible with the other guy? As long as, you, as your frequency and his frequency are at least, you know, I'm talking about a 3 dB roll off. So you got to be far enough away from him that your symbols don't interfere with his. So the two carry, Remember on the satellite, you see how big those troughs were? They're very clear about making certain those transponders are very w wide enough because they don't want interference. Yeah, I just wanted to, yeah, I was wondering if something with a, a different ratio could communicate with those. So the reason why this chart is here is I'm stuck with running a certain symbol rate so I don't interfere with him. But you can change the forward error correction because he that doesn't matter to him. Okay. That's the point. Thank you. So check the settings before you start transmitting. <laughs> okay, so we're almost out of time, but so basically this is one of the advanced topics. So one of the things we did up in Mount Diablo, because we put them up in approximately four megahertz to leave a two megahertz input side on another machine. So he's transmitting on frequency X. I want to be X plus as an input to another site. And then its output is going to be on another frequency, and it's going to leave some space for another input. You see what I'm doing there. But the point here is on this slide, uh, to make, because they're running four channels in a four megahertz, so they're really, pu we're pushing bandwidth up there. So we're using uh, one of those really, nice ion encoders that I got off eBay. And so basically, it's doing what's called StatMux. And this is a very complicated process, but the encoders are changing bit rate on the fly. So if the camera's in the fog, it doesn't need the bandwidth. So that way, Fred can sit over there and wave in the camera, and it won't break up the video as much, because he's getting all the bandwidth. But the second the fog clears, and birds and bees start flying in front of the camera, then the encoders are going to start stat muxing like crazy. And so this is what's possible. And, and what I've tried to demonstrate here is here's four six megahertz allocations side by side. So this would have been four analog channels. And in the same space, here's like what's Mount Diablo with a two meg input. Here's another system running three megahertz with three one megahertz slots a single six megahertz that's, you know, let's just say we leave one for the analog or if somebody wants to go up and Ultra HD, knock yourself out, and then another one of those. So basically, if you do the math, I can put up more video and audio in digital than you would have ever been able to put up in your analog allocations that we've put in our spectrum. 
So that was one of the big motivations. So getting started. You're going to need some parts. Obviously, we've got antennas, LNAs. You're going to look for an IRD. You probably have an old analog TV. Hang on to at least one analog TV. It doesn't have to be the, the deep tube, you know, vacuum tube, picture tube. It, you know, some of the TVs we still have still have the analog components. Um, ATV uh, means if you want to transmit, you're going to need camera, microphone, a modulator. Well, this is where I'm blending. You know, you put in some other parts and pieces, and you can do analog or digital. We're hams. Don't be afraid of the camera. Put it on your kids. Come here, son. Chase them around with a camera. Let's get some programming going. Uh, so are you ready to get started? Excellent. So I hopefully I didn't make your brain melt too much. So MCOM is a great use for ATV. And anybody that's ever done it before understands what I'm talking about. You can see things. You, you know, I mean, if you're running a net on a, on a relay race, you know, one of these marathon things, you know, somebody needs water at station number 12, and so-and-so fell and broke his knee on station number 5, and, you know, that's great. But if you see pictures, you can actually get a better feel for what's going on around the event. But basically, how about doing some production around field day? How about doing some production around this event? Yeah, where is that camera? <laughs> yeah, we will televise this later. Aren't you glad I'm almost done? So Microsoft is a piece of crap. I had some really insightful <laughs> words. So basically, yeah, now we got to deal with this three-legged bar stool. OK, you can't get something for nothing. When you go digital, you, you got bandwidth, latency, and uh, what was the third thing? Oh, complexity, but so that's why I need my slide. Anyway, if you want latency to reduce, you have to jack up the bandwidth. You can't get all three of them for free. So when you start, if you, if you want lower bit rate so that you can mid it, you know, get it into something, then you're going to start messing with quality. Oh, the third one was quality. So to maintain quality, you have to have high bit rate or a clean source or whatever. So basically, you're, you're moving knobs around. Um, so as I said before, AM only supports SD. Uh, one channel requires 6 megahertz, and it's easily distorted. Digital, yes, there's a buffer delay. Uh, you can introduce artifacts, adds more cost. And it, there is a learning curve, and it has a cliff. Digital signals have this, you get to a point, get to a point, get to a point, and bam, it falls off. What's the threshold? Everybody's is going to be different. Well, so, yeah, the problem. Uh, it's, it's hard to answer, so you're going to have to work on being able to get empirical data of your own. Because I don't know where you live. I don't know who you're trying to talk to. Well, it's in terms of received signal level. I've worked QPSK signals 60 kilometers, and I was just seeing them come up out of the noise. And I got a lock. So it's that good. So who wants to do ATV? Yay. Yay. So here's the problem. There is no kits. That's the problem. This is the tough nut to crack. Uh, we're going to be probably looking and working with people just to get. I've I've managed. I go dumpster diving at work. So let me be clear. I got enough encoders to give everybody in this room an encoder. I got a problem. We got to figure out how to deal with this problem. So basically, we're going to start helping people get systems on the air. I've already started, the, the Mount Diablo guys have a lot of my stuff. In fact, their new truck just got a Christmas present last night. And so this is the stuff we can do. You and I, we can sit down and, you know, let's, let's investigate what that little part was. What is the noise figure on that? That's the stuff we can do. Build the antennas, you know, discover new cameras and, and stuff like that. So this is what you're going to want to look for. Things that are blue. I'm just kidding. Um, Blonder Tongue, he's been doing cable products for a long time. Divicom, where I came from, Harmonic is now the new name. They made Electras and Ions. There's Ericsson's, there's Motorola's. New Tech makes modulators. Scopus uh, is the Israel company that we acquired that does the decoders. Scientific Atlanta, tons of SA equipment out there. So all this stuff is starting to show up on eBay. So if you do searches on any one of these topics, 
you'll see what I'm talking about. Just they're showing up in pallets now. And so basically, I want to leave you with a bunch of links. Ron, I'm sorry, I forgot to edit your link in there. That's what I forgot to do this morning. He's texted it to me, and I forgot to put it there. So basically, these are all the sources for everything I was talking about today. ARRL, ATN TV, ATSC, Batsy, Dark, DVB, MDark. You see what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. So I read an article within the last year that talked about selecting transmission formats, and you talked about ATSB and, and uh, QAM, and, and um, I know COFD on this left off that one chart. But I noticed it looks like you've zoomed in or picked on DVBS, and I wondered if you would speak to the choice of that versus DVBT. So the DVBT modulation system was designed and defined for um, transmission in Europe. Okay, so they standardized on 6, 7, and 8 megahertz wide. So now where do you get the DVB-T receiver? So that means you've got to get a dongle or a TV shipped over from Europe or China or wherever they come from. So then you've got to get everybody else to standardize on those things. So Is it, that only if you set the symbol rate that high, though? What if you reduce it and reduce the bandwidth? So there, like I mentioned before, there are products that give you a knob that allow you to reduce their uh, chipping rate to be able to create the OFDM. So then the problem is, will the receiver that you have support those rates? So if you go below six, you're going to lose all the consumer devices. Well, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to get narrow. And the guys over at Batsy, they're running 333 kilosymbols per second. They're trying to put all their power in this very narrow slice of symbol rate. And that's why they use it for broadcasting. And, yes. And so it seems like we're in that terrestrial world, which he stands for. Yeah. So that's why I asked the question. So this is a great point, and this is one of those. That's why that slide was there, is because this topic comes up every single time. So if you look at the universe of things we're trying to solve, DVBT is a good solution, and it's great for point to point. When you have matched receivers, transmitter receiver pairs, then that's not the problem. Those work great. But the second you try to send it out to a wider audience, that's when you're going to start losing people. You won't get everybody to be able to match the equipment. Or they have to buy the special one. So then you have to have another one. We're just trying to talk about just getting people on the air, period. It could be. It just depends on what problem are you trying to solve. Right. You talked about the allocation of bandwidth within 6 megahertz, and you were saying that the, the downlink from the repeater was three uplinks for one. Um, <coughs> and so I guess my question is, why have a wider downlink if your uplink isn't sending the data rate there? Because the downlink could be a massive multiplex of many. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Not Great question. See, this is what I'm talking about. You've been doing it for how long? Me too. Yeah, we're missing some of the chief engineers. Bob Olson was here last night. Bob Hess was just here before me. He's KOVR in Sacramento. Yeah, he's had my equipment for 21 years. Yeah, they're here. We kind of lurk in the woodwork, you know. We do this for a living kind of thing. But I'm just the only one will. We, we, <laughs> apparently not. And now I got this other problem. Here, buy my stuff. Anyway, I think we're out of time. <laughs>